I'm so thankful for that. So thank y'all for your many prayers, and uh, praise the Lord for that too. Anyone else? Of course, we continue on with the, the fall revival coming up, and we continue to let others know. And, and of course, we'll have special singers here. We have enough room to socially distance, so you don't have to worry about that. Of course, just like the services, there's masks at the door. Uh, there's a, we have hand sanitizer around the building. Uh, you know, if somebody wanted to sit up top or, or in the back, uh, that option is definitely available for you. Anyone else? Okay, just a, a little heads up for those that were not able to attend the business meeting. See you. The Deacons, the Finance Committee, and of course, uh, Building Grounds uh, have decided that when we uh, vote for the total amounts, we'll do the drive-through uh, tent like we did last time. Uh, since we're talking about $65,000, and of course, uh, we, we haven't decided actually when to pull the trigger. They will decide that at the next finance meeting, meaning uh, they're going to give time and, and trust in the Lord, but also not making a compulsive uh, decision. Uh, but, uh, but you will be able to come by and drive by uh, tent, and we could at least uh, vote on the numbers. Is that correct back there, Rex? That's yeah. how we're going to do it. We want to make sure you at home, uh, when we're voting on stuff like this, like we did with the pews, uh, your givers, you might not be here in person, uh, I want you to give an opportunity to, to share your voice. And uh, I'm thankful for the deacons and the uh, uh, others uh, deciding on that. That is great. And we had a great turnout last time, probably about 13 or 14 votes outside, did we not? Uh, so that was great. So, of course, uh, we look forward to that. We're just continuing to pray uh, through this. And, of course, trust the Lord and thank Him for all that's going on here. Uh, anyone else? Okay, if not, let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Jehovah, we beseech you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we come to you because you are the ear to our prayers. You are the one that listens. You are the one that convinces. And God, you are the one that loves us so much to in turn an attentive ear to our prayers. God, we lift these people up to you that are on the prayer list, those that are going through physical situations, those that are going through financial problems, those that are needing a, a touch from you, Lord, those that are just needing an answer to a decision uh, that they have been praying for for a while, and God, they haven't got a clear direction or a clear answer, oh God, I pray that you would uh, answer in your time, and what seems to be a delay, uh, just might be providing another opportunity, Heavenly Father, uh, just like the sanctuary renovation, Lord, we, we praise you for those that have given those that are already searching their heart on what they're going to do and how they're going to proceed. And Heavenly Father, your scripture says do nothing out of uh, compulsion. And Lord, we don't do it because we have to make a compulsive decision, but we do it with a cheerful heart. And God, I pray we give because it's uh, according to you that gives us the blessings and your blessings, the tithes, the offerings that we give, we give unto you. All that they come into your house here and go into an offering plate. Ultimately, Lord, it's our expression of love, of the portion that you have given to us. Thank you for blessing us. If I could ask anyone around here online or uh, in the congregation today how much you have blessed us, Lord, we wouldn't have enough notebook paper to fill up. Lord, you have blessed us beyond measure. And God, I pray you continue to do that, uh, that you would guide us and restore our hearts, Lord, to you, and that we would continue to be faithful as you are faithful to us. In Jesus' name.
place your faith. Father, we just want to touch the lives of so many people. If just one person comes to know you through using the preaching of your word, Father, we count that as a thing. Glory. Pastor Trent is coming over here to serve you as an extension of his ministry over here. So glad that he is coming. And God, how you have used him mightily. He's encouraged me already. And I pray that you would just encourage the body of Christ and, and even myself, Heavenly Father. If there's uh, something in my life that I need to uh, rededicate to you or uh, strive to be a, a better pastor, Heavenly Father, I welcome that. Thank you so much for the congregation and the people that uh, might come that I've never seen before, Heavenly Father. I pray that as we are going through Who's Your One series, Lord, we be reminded to invite somebody to church, maybe perhaps 
In that way, it's initially and at the end result, God is inviting them to you. And God, we pray that you would work through Trent's messages. We pray that you interrupt them if need be, that you use the words that you would have, even for the one, the two, the three people that needs to go out. Your boy, your word will never return back boy. I pray it will go out and accomplish what it needs to accomplish, God, and you would uh, put here who you seem need to hear your words. I'm praying for lost souls. I'm praying for rededicated souls that already love you, Lord, and that we could love you even more with our hearts. And God, for the uh, time of the sanctuary renovation and how you're going to provide, how you're going to do it, uh, we pray you do it in such a way, Heavenly Father, that you bless this church beyond measure. You've been faithful to so many people. So many people have raised their children here, got married, been saved, and Lord, you are not through here. You're going to do great things. And God, let us step out of faith, trust you, and God continuing to be that light in the midst of darkness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you're turning your Bibles to Psalm chapter 21, uh, Psalm chapter 21 tonight, of course we're going uh, through the book of Psalms and we end on Psalms 21 tonight, okay, uh, we know that uh, uh, David in Psalms uh, 20 is uh, in prayer to have victory over his enemies, he is also in prayer uh, that God will give him uh, deliverance, and as his prayer comes about, guess what? He gets an answer to his prayer in Psalms 20 that rolls over from prayer to praise. So we see in Psalms 21, David is going to praise the Lord for the deliverance that only God has given to him. Now we've talked about many armies. We've talked about men. We've talked about weapons. But at the end of the day, it is the Lord that brings the victory. You'll see that over and over through the book of Psalm. Actually, you'll see it over and over from the book of Genesis all the way to Revelation. Now, David is acknowledging that true deliverance from the enemies of God and the enemies of God's children is victory through God. In our day and time, we would spell that out with Jesus Christ our Lord. And so we look here in chapter 21, verse 1, and start with me here. It says, O Lord, in your strength, the king will be glad, and in your salvation, how greatly he will rejoice. So we see here that rejoicing, it is in the king's strength, and we see that it is in his salvation that the king grants these things. Uh, so acknowledging the Lord, of course, is one of the best ways you're going to get answers to your prayers because you know God has the wisdom and the advice to grant your prayers requests. Now we know in 1 Samuel 30, uh, verse 8, David says in God's word, David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this man? Shall I overtake them? And he said to him, Pursue, for you will surely overtake them, and you will surely rescue all. You see, inquiring of the Lord inquires of God's victory. You can't say, I'm going to make my plans and ask God's stamp of approval on them. Actually, it's the other way around. You're actually consulting with the Lord. You're asking for what? Divine intervention. And if you ask for God's intervention, you better step out of the way because God loves to bring deliverance. So we see that in verse 1. He goes on to verse 2. He says, You have given him his heart's desire. You have not withheld the request of his lips. Selah, what he is saying here. David, of course, we're going to have messianic tones all through the scripture here, and we'll get to that soon. But if you are on the same page with the Lord, ultimately, you are having the desires of the Lord. 
If God has something in mind for you to do or to accomplish, at the end of the day, God is tuning you in in that prayer life to His desires and plans. So you know why you can rejoice in your desires is because you've been rejoicing with the Lord. And you see here, He says, I, you have given him his heart's desire. Uh, Proverbs 16, 3 states, Commit your works to the Lord and your plans will be established. I remember being a new Christian reading that and thinking to myself, okay, so really, as long as it is not sin, whatever I do, whenever I put my hand on the plow, God's going to bless it. My plans are going to succeed because it doesn't have anything to do with sin, being unethically wrong, uh, but being out of the will of God is wrong. Uh, being out of His plans are wrong. So we see here, you do not just take that one verse and isolate it in Proverbs 16, 3, commit your works to the Lord, your plans will be established, but you accompany it with going down a little further in Proverbs 16, 9. It says, the mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. You see, ultimately, the God of this universe, the God of creation, is in control. So these desires that are in your heart, make sure in prayer, they're the desires God has for you. Uh, you know, growing up, I wanted to be, uh, and with, with uh, uh, great enthusiasm, I would love to fly an Air Force jet, you know, I would love to do that. Uh, but I realize that is not my calling. That surely is not my skills. And I don't have maybe an engineer mind or an architect mind to, uh, uh, to lay out uh, blueprints and, and measurements to the exact uh, measurements they need to be and, and, and to build these things. I mean, God would surely not ask me to build the ark. I mean, I would mess some things up. I might cut some corners. I, I'm more of a, a big picture kind of guy. Yes, the details are important because without the details, you couldn't have the big picture. That's why the body of Christ, when it's working together, it's a well-old machine. That means we're all working together. You might have some architects. You might have some engineers. You might have more of a people person over here. You might have an introvert. You might have an extrovert. And we're working all together for His will, for His plans. So what desires has the Lord laid upon your heart, whatever God's made you to be, whether it's in the secular workplace, whether it's in the vocation of a church, at the end of the day, we do all things to the glory of His name. With the gifts He has given us, the skills He's enabled us to have, and the desires that He has placed upon our heart. Here we see, He says, you have given Him His heart's desires, and you have not withheld the request of His lips. Now the King David here has been petitioning upon the Lord in Psalms 20. He's petitioning that God would bring victory because ultimately at the end of the day when God brings victory to David and God's people, what he is doing, listen, is bringing victory and glory to himself, to his plans, to his purpose, to his will. And we know in verse 3 it also, if we go a little further, it says, you met him with the blessings of good things. You set a crown of fine gold on his head. We look at the crown here. We know David later received a crown. Let's make this straight. Straight as I know how to make it. David wasn't after a crown. God chose him. God sent after him. David was being faithful taking care of the sheep and making sure they were not harmed. Do you better believe God saw David's heart? Do you believe that God saw David singing out in the pasture, praising the Lord and being faithful with his sheep to protect them from a bear, to protect them from lions, to protect the sheep from whatever it is? Yes, he saw that. And guess what? He wanted to anoint David, a 
God that's looking after the sheep is a God that can look after Israel. I want Him. Although we know that the people of Israel, they cried out for a king and God warned them and they got Saul. Yes, he was anointed by God. God used him as a discipline uh, uh, device for them. But David was on his mind. 1 Samuel 16, 10-13 states, Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are these all the children? He said, There remains yet the youngest. And behold, he is tending the sheep. Then Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was Rudy, and with beautiful eyes and handsome appearance. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. David wasn't after the crown. But because of David's faithfulness to the Lord, he was ready to take possession later of the crown. Now, did David get the crown right away? No, he did not. Saul still had the crown, did he not? Saul still led these people through rebellion. Uh, David still had to run away from Saul. And we need to be reminded when Saul was killed, tried to kill himself at first, then he was killed. Jonathan was killed. We know that the scripture says that David cried over them. And the people surrounding David cried over Saul. It seems you would just rejoice over Saul being dead. But David knew that was still God's anointed king. Acts 2.30 states, when talking about Father God that gave us Jesus Christ, that got what? The crown. He says, and so, because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seek one of his descendants on his throne. We know a descendant of David came by the house of Jesse, uh, the stump, the root. It would be none other than Jesus Christ later on coming from his offspring. Revelation 7, 14 states, these will wage war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, because He is the Lord of lords and King of kings. And those who are with Him are called and chosen and faithful. You see here, we have King Jesus. So the Messianic tone is already prevailing through this text. And in verse 4, in God's Word in Psalms 21, He asks, Life of you. You gave it to him. Length of days forever and ever. God ultimately, listen to this, exceeds our expectations and can lengthen our days. Now, biblically speaking, we cannot say just because we are faithful that God somehow is going to let us live through cancer. Could he extend our days you better believe it. He can do what he wants to in that regards. Could he take us by cancer? Yes, that too. There's a purpose and a plan for everything, even when we do not see it. Uh, but Isaiah 38, 5 states, about a time Hezekiah had an extension of days. We know that Hezekiah got an extension of days. Why? Because he repented with a contrite heart. And God saw what he did. Listen to this. Go and tell Hezekiah, this is what the Lord, the God of the Father David, said. I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will add 15 years to your life. You see, God can extend somebody's life. Now, we also see in parts of Scripture where uh, God can allow somebody's sin to take their life a little bit prematurely. Uh, but when we're talking about a sovereign God, was it even prematurely? God knew that plan was going to run its course. That person was going to do this. God knew that Hezekiah was going to turn back to him. And he's already thought in his mind and knew that he would extend his 
days. And I just read this week that a 117 year old woman with a weakness for fizzy drinks and chocolate has become Japan's oldest person on record. As a country marks a public holiday devoted to its senior citizens, Kane Tanaka, who had already been recognized by the Guinness Book of Records as the world's oldest living person in March last year, achieved an all-time Japanese age record on Saturday when she becomes 117 years and 261 years old. There's one thing this woman is, is promised. Two things, rather. She will die eventually. And I'm not saying that sarcastically. Uh, but there's also a promise in Genesis 6, 3 that states, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his day shall be 120 years. She will not live past that day. Do you agree? Do we take God's word to be true? Do you need to look up some research for me and bring me a person that's lived past 120 years? Or is that just something that's in the Bible and that happened for a certain amount of time? Or is that a promise forever that man will not live past 120 years old? We know that David died. We know that God was going to use David to establish the throne. In fact, the Davidic promise is found in 2 Samuel 7.13. states, He shall build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And third of all, we see, therefore, David died, but established Christ's kingdom forever. How did he do that? The genealogy. Through his life, through David, through Jesse, would come the Lord Jesus Christ. We see this in Luke chapter 3. It says, the son Nathan, uh, the son of David, the son of Jesse. Eventually, we know that's the lineage of Jesus. That's the genealogy of the tree of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So the Messianic tone is relevant in this passage. And we see in verse 5 of uh, Psalms 21, His glory is great through your salvation, splendor, and majesty, your place upon Him. Now, we can correlate this verse with 1 Peter 2.17 that states, for when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to the lyrics of the song Majesty. Majesty, worship his majesty. Unto Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise. Majesty, kingdom authority. Flow from his throne unto his own, his anthem raised. So exalt, lift up the name, the high name of Jesus. Magnify, come glorify Jesus Christ, the King. Majesty, worship his majesty. Jesus who died, now glorified. King of all kings. Although we see at the end of this, in the Old Testament, the kings and the line of kings, they were silent for such a time. Now, did God go back on his word that he would set up a, a kingdom and someone on the throne forever? No, not at all. Uh, Jesus Christ would be the eternal king that no one could dethrone. Now, let's look at verse 6. For you make him most blessed forever. You make him joyful with gladness in your presence. God has made David a blessing to the nations. You know, we see also that God has made Jesus a blessing to the nations. And of course, as I said, the kingship of David ended. We know that the Assyrian Empire took over the northern king of Israel, kingdom of Israel. Uh, we know the Babylonian Empire took over the southern kingdom of Judah. But where are the Assyrians and the Babylonians now? One thing is for sure, we know that Jesus still remains. We know that Jesus' king, his throne, his kingship is eternal, everlasting, 
There's been many of kings, many of nations. Uh, we can think back through history of a lot of people like uh, Genghis Khan. We can think about other people that had rule. We have to think about Napoleon. That lasted but a while. But I know one thing for sure, that Jesus Christ will last forever. He will continue His reign and continue His throne because He is King Jesus and His throne is not up for vacancy. He is, as verse 7 says, for the King trust in the Lord. And through the loving kindness of the Most High, we will not be shaken. Dear children of God, no matter where you are in your spiritual life tonight, Jesus has given us a foundation that cannot be be shaken. You're a child of Him. The King is still in control. Now, the International Standard, Standard Bible Encyclopedia would state the word loving kindness uh, does not occur in the New Testament. But as equivalents, we have such terms as mercy, goodness, kindness, and brotherly love. You see, His loving kindness was extended to His children. You're part of that kingdom. You're a part of the eternal dynasty that will have no end. His love, His compassion is for you. So loving kindness, God's loving kindness means to be gracious or merciful. Now this is a steadfast love. God's love never ends. It is a steadfast love. His loving kindness we know that in the book of Jeremiah, there was a time of discipline for God's people, were there not? There was a time, but I like Jeremiah 31, 1 through 3, that talks about God's loving kindness. And in that fact, when you start reading on through Jeremiah 30 and all, you learn about a new covenant, of course, that would be Jesus Christ that would set up a kingdom. Yes, the people were going to be disciplined for such a time. But even that was a part of God's loving kindness. Because He wanted the best for the Israelites. He wanted the best for God's people. Yeah, Jeremiah 31, 1 through 3 states, And at that time declares the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people, thus says the Lord. The people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. Israel, when it went to find its rest, the Lord appeared to him. From afar saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with my loving kindness. God's loving kindness is what draw you in. We know in 1 John, he states that we love because Christ loved us first. Christ's love on the cross before you were even created was a token of His loving kindness before you were even born when He was bleeding on the cross, when He was dying a horrible, innocent man's death. He had you in mind and He drawed you by His loving kindness. So we know in Proverbs 3, 11 through 12, and you can also see this echoed again in what? Romans. You can see that He says, My son, do not reject the discipline of the Lord, or loathe is reproof. For whom the Lord loves, He reproves. Even as a father corrects the son, in whom he delights. I reminded one of my children uh, a little while back that uh, I love them. I could see they might have been a little discouraged by the way I disciplined or might have called them the time out or corrected them. But you know what? After he cooled down a little bit or one of them cooled down a little bit, I walked up and so they let me have a hug. I said, you're going to have a lot of friends in this world, but you're only going to have one daddy. And you see here, you only have one heavenly father that cares for you like he does. Like he cared for David to deliver him, he cares for you to keep you on a constant state of deliverance. In verse 8 in chapter 21 says, your hand will find out all your enemies, your right hand will find out all that hate you. So we see here, of course, he's praising the Lord for deliverance. And he's also acknowledging that divine intervention destroys all of God's 
enemies eventually. And again, divine intervention will put an end to evil forever. There will be no more existence for evil in the end. God has a plan. And so we have to be careful as Christians. We have to stop telling God with our words and actions what He can't do. God can do more, and mightily more, in His power than we could ever conjure up or imagine. We step out in faith and trust Him, and we see what God's wanting to do. In Psalms 21.9, You make them as a fiery oven in the time of your anger. The Lord will swallow them up in His wrath, and fire will devour them. And of course, He's praising the Lord for deliverance, that means judgment for the wicked. That means if David is going to be delivered, it's because he is walking in righteousness and he's delivered from the people of wickedness. In fact, if you want to take an approach to this fire that is beyond uh, the New Testament, talking about fire in the book of Revelation on a literal place called hell, you would turn to none other than Malachi 4, uh, 1 through 2. It says, For behold... The day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and every evildoer will be like chaff. And the day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you, fear my name. This is a good thing for us children today. Listen to this. Children of the Lord, fear his name. The Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. And you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. Now we rejoice in Him because of our salvation. We rejoice in Him because He's King of our life. And we say we rejoice in Him because God's loving kindness consumes His children. But God's wrath consumes unbelievers and the wicked. Those who want to do their own thing, not trust in the Lord, do not have time for them, uh, for him. We continually pray for them because we know God loves the sinner but hates the sin. In verse 10 in chapter 21 of Psalms, it says, Their offspring you will destroy from the earth, and their descendants are from the sons of men. Now we see God uses David to end any hopes of his enemies' continual existence. We also see all future generation of people that could practice evil should be and will be extinguished because of God's holiness. And God disciplines His children. God brings down wrath on those that are not His children. So this deliverance is from the Lord. Uh, uh, verse 11. Though they intended evil against you and devised a plot, they will not succeed. Now, a question for you tonight. Can God use wicked people for His purpose? Can God ultimately, in His big plan, not only use children of the light, but children of the dark? He sure can. Now, we know in Hebek, uh, Habakkuk, excuse me, 1 5 states, for behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that furious, people who march throughout the earth to seize dwelling places which are not theirs. Who raised up the Chaldeans? The Lord of hosts. Who raised them up for His ultimate purpose? The Lord of hosts. Uh, now how we ask another question uh, will God use wicked people for His ultimate design and His purpose for destruction for those wicked people. And biblically, they don't self set well with some people. Uh, but if we're biblically honest in biblical theology, we see in Proverbs 16, 4. Also, as I talked to you in verse 3 and 4 of Proverbs 16, we commit our ways to the Lord. He establishes our set uh, our steps. But guess what? He establishes the steps of the wicked too in between those two verses. We see in Proverbs 16, 4, the Lord has made everything for its own purpose, even the wicked for the day of evil. So God has even a plan 
for them. God has a plan for the children of God. I tell you tonight, you want to be in the plan that honors the Lord. You want to be in the plan that is of righteousness and His direct step, following after the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 12 says, For you will make them turn their back. You will aim with your bowstrings at their faces. You say, how cruel can God be? Listen to this. How cruel do people become when they continue on in their ways of lawlessness over and over again? God put order in the world. God put police officers in the world. Why? Because we see right now on the television a world without them. We see what's going on. We see when they do not have their weapons. We see who people really become without constraint, with lawlessness. They, in fact, turn their backs on God. It wasn't God at first turning His back on them. They turned their back on the Lord. But David ends this psalm reminding us to be, he reminds himself to the Lord, be exalted, O Lord, in your strength. We will sing and praise your power. David begins well, and he definitely ends well, knowing that the Lord is with him. He trusts in him. And we too shall enter into the Lord's rest of deliverance. When you receive Christ, you are delivered from sin. But as the Apostle Paul says, as we go daily through life, we die daily to the flesh and live more and more in Christ. You want divine intervention in your life? You need to acknowledge that He has the answers. You can reach out to Him. And guess what? He loves to deliver someone with a contrite heart. Oh God, David said, in the sin of Bathsheba, you will not despise. Let's go to the Lord and pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for David's faithfulness. I thank you, God, that we can follow in your faithfulness. Lord, thank you for being faithful to me personally. And others can agree in their own life. Being faithful to us at times when we're not faithful. You've been great, God. You have exceeded our expectations. And your love and kindness is on me over and over again. I'm praying for those that are at home that maybe are not here to be in, a, in the audience today. Those that maybe have never even attended the church, God, that are listening to the words of Psalms 21 tonight. Your word, God, your faithfulness, your deliverance. That God, they would acknowledge you and lift up praise to you tonight or whenever they hear the message. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for your loving kindness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.